Welcome to the Healthful Woman Podcast. Today is Monday, February 8th, 2021. I hope you all had a great weekend. Last week, we were fortunate to hear twice from Dr. Marla Baum on how our kids learn. This week, we're going to continue the theme of parenting as I'm joined by Dr. Tracy Agnesi today and again on Thursday to talk about newborns. Tracy's a pediatrician in New York City and also has her own YouTube channel. You can search that under Tracy MD. That's Tracy with an EY at the end. Tracy is passionate about getting good information to parents, so she was happy to come on our podcast. I'm sure you will find her interesting and helpful and very practical. Today, we're going to focus on newborn care from the time of birth until going home from the hospital. And on Thursday, we're going to discuss the rough and tumble first few months. Remember, next week on Thursday, we're going to be dropping our first high-risk birth stories podcast. So be on the lookout from that. Try to search for high-risk birth stories on your own podcast platform. And if it's already available, you may as well subscribe now so you don't miss any when they start dropping. Finally, last week, I wished a happy birthday to my dog, Biscuit. Today, I want to wish a happy birthday to my other dog, Blue, who turns two on Wednesday. Blue, rescuing you from the mean streets of Tennessee was one of the greatest decisions we ever made. Actually, my wife made the decision unilaterally and only told the rest of us about it later, so all the credit goes to Michal. Still, Blue, you're a rock star. Happy birthday. Thanks for listening. Have a great day. Welcome to today's episode of Healthful Woman, a podcast designed to explore topics in women's health at all stages of life. I am your host, Dr. Nathan Fox, an OBGYN and maternal fetal medicine specialist practicing in New York City. At Healthful Woman, I speak with leaders in the field to help you learn more about women's health, pregnancy, and wellness. All right, I'm here with Dr. Tracy Agnesi, who is a, a wonderful pediatrician on the west side of Manhattan in the practice called Pediatric and Adolescent medicine, which is very descriptive. Yes. <laughs> Not general at all. Excellent. And and Tracy, of course, is an FOM, a friend <laughs> of Melka, which is how we got connected. Thank you for coming in. Thank you for being on the podcast. How you doing? Good. Thanks so much for having me. I'm so excited. This is wonderful. So we were in touch before by email and we spoke and we sort of had a very similar realization that there's information that we want people to have. And so I started a podcast and you started doing stuff online with YouTube and Instagram. And this is, we're going to, is the confluence. This is where it all comes together. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. So tell us what, what exactly are you doing now online? Yeah. So I um, started with a YouTube channel where mm -hmm. basically I just want to give information to new moms about how to take care of their newborn baby, but also really importantly is how to take care of themselves as a new mom. Ooh. Because I really feel uh, that that gets so overlooked. And so um, it actually started with something that I had like six years ago when after I had my first daughter and my sister, who I'm super close with, was living on the other side of the country at the time. And she had her first about eight months after. I had mine and I wanted to give her advice like as a pediatrician and as a new mom um, but also as a sister and like right. take care of yourself this way too and so I never did anything with it until recently when COVID hit and I had a little more time on my hands but um, but and as a new mom I had a harder time than I thought I would like as right. a pediatrician I thought oh, okay you know it's all gonna be fine I didn't really think much of it I guess so I was pretty shocked by how hard it was to take care of a new baby um, and to try to still find and take care of yourself during that transition transition. So I focus on that. Yeah, I was um, I was either smart enough or stupid enough to have all of our kids before I became an MFM. So I didn't really know anything, which is great. So I never thought it'd be anything. I, I don't think I thought at all, maybe ever, uh, actually. So how do people find you? What What is your YouTube channel? Yeah. So if you go to my website, TracyMD.com, then it has a cl uh, link to my YouTube channel and to my Instagram account. On Instagram, I'm babydocmama. TracyMD, that's it? Yeah, that's it. TracyMD.com. You got an early. I know. And I uh, <laughs> T-R-A-C-E-Y. And I was like, yeah, but I should buy the domain without the E too. So did you? I did. Yeah. Oh my God, yeah, that's amazing. Just, you know. <laughs> <laughs> just in case. Just All right, in so, case. So, and how have you found that so far? In sort Because of, it's a total change in paradigm mm -hmm. for us. Like we're so used to doing it a certain way and everything's through like writing and reading and articles and books and stuff or talking to patients. And then when we start doing something like this where you're recording your voice or your face or your video, it, it's so, it's like jarring in a way. How, how did you find it when you started? I find it so much more fun than I even thought. Yeah, I just, I started recording and I just pressed record and said, I'm not even gonna have to use this if I don't want, you know, and right. it, to just let myself loosen up and start talking. But 
once I started doing a few of them, I just kind of pretend I'm talking to a friend or, you know, patient in the exam room. And um, and it is funny. I hear my voice differently now than <laughs> than I did before, because now I listen to myself when I'm editing these videos. And I feel like I hear myself so much that when I'm talking out loud in person, I, I hear it differently in all my, you know, intonations and stuff I never really paid attention to. I It's very apparent now, but right. it's fun. I'm having a lot of fun with it. It's also interesting when you podcast to listen to yourself on 1.5 speed. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I listened to, I was on a podcast recently and I speak fast. I'm actually trying to slow things down in general. I'm a fast talker and I always listen to podcasts on 1.5 speed and I listen to myself on 1.5 speed and I was like, whoa, you really have to slow down. So <laughs> <laughs> it was ridiculous. Yeah. When I hear myself on fast speed, it's a little terrifying. <laughs> yeah. Like, oh my God, this is, this is Nady on speed. Excellent. So, so tell us a little about yourself. Sure. You know, where are you from? How'd you get into medicine? How'd you get into pediatrics? Yeah, I'm from New Jersey and I went, I did all my training in New York. I went to SUNY Downstate for medical school. That's where I met Melka. Um, and then I did my pediatrics residency at NYU. And I've been practicing in the city for almost 10 years. And as a private pediatrician, I think I always thought I wanted to go into pediatrics. You know, as a kid, I used to buy stuffed animals at garage sales with my mom saying, I'll put this in my PD's office one day. Um, but in medical school, I actually thought for a little while, I when I started, I thought I wanted to do OB, but then I realized I don't not a surgeon. And I was really interested in the baby when the baby came out after delivery. Um, so I did peds. I thought I wanted to do adolescent medicine in residency. But then I I, I quickly realized I wanted to do gen peds that I like from newborn until there. You know, right. The whole the whole thing. So you let Jalinthia do the adolescent. Absolutely. I know we reconnected recently. Actually, she came by the office when she was back in New York. Yeah. And um, she's amazing at that. Yeah. So yeah. That's a all, special all, you know, yeah. thing that <laughs> all, all half of my guests are the FOMs, the friends of Melka. <laughs> She's uh, she definitely hooks me up with all her friends. It's great. That's funny. Now that you're, you know, you're a pediatrician, you're practicing in the city. And I wanted to start, I guess we'll start from the beginning to talk about, you know, newborn care, because that's really obviously people's first, you know, experience as parents is when the baby's born in the hospital. And so there's a lot of like confusion, like what actually happens in the hospital after the baby's born yeah. with the baby? Like, what do you do in yeah. terms of you come and see them? Yeah, sure. So when the baby's born, of course, if there's anything urgently, right, you're calling the NICU doctors and the ICU in-house um, neonatologists are going right. to be the ones coming and assess the babies. So us as the general pediatricians, the first time we're meeting the baby is within 24 hours of birth. And we usually do that, you know, in the morning when we're rounding in that next morning. So we come in and of course we read, you know, all the the prenatal history first. When things we look at that are important is, you know, the um, any medicines or issues that the mother had during pregnancy. Pregnancy. And we always like to know the uh, GBS group B uh, strep status of the of the mom. And we like to look at the blood types of the mom and the baby to see if the baby uh, is a setup for jaundice or not. Um, that's one thing, you know, those are the uh, some of the key things in the in the chart that we're looking at and, you know, what type of delivery it was and all that. Mm -hmm. um, and when we check the baby, we I think all of us kind of do it similarly where we go from head to toe. I think that's mm -hmm. kind of how we all think about it. So, you know, we're feeling the head and we're feeling the uh, fontanelles and the sutures, making sure everything's in place. Um, we're looking at the baby baby first, actually just making sure that everything looks symmetric and normal as well, making sure that the ears and the eyes and the nose, you know, that the nerves are patent and that everything looks like it should. Um, in the mouth, oftentimes we'll put a finger in the mouth of the baby, uh, assess the baby's suck, make sure that there's um, the palate is okay, that there's no cleft palate. Um, we look at the tongue, underneath the tongue, the frenulums, make sure everything, you know, anatomically is okay there. Um, then we will usually feel the clavicles and make sure that there's, you know, nothing that feels that it's broken, that the arms are moving symmetrically. Um, we check the hands of course, five fingers, five toes, and make sure everything looks correct there. Of course, we listen to the heart and the lungs, make sure the lungs are clear, make sure the heart sounds um, that there's you know no concerns there. Uh, we feel the baby's belly, make sure that there's no um, you know masses or anything that we would be concerned about in the belly. Uh, we take a look at the umbilical cord and we look at the number of vessels and make sure that it looks like it is already healing appropriately. We take the baby's diaper off, we look at the genitalia, make sure that it's a normal male or normal female genitalia. We check the hips while we're down there too. And we make sure the hips are moving correctly and that they're not um, out of the hip sockets. That's something that can be detected even in that first that first exam. And then we always turn the baby over onto the baby's tummy. We take a look at the back, make sure the spine looks straight, make sure that if there is a dimple in the um, above the butt area, which is not uncommon, a sacral dimple, we like to look at it, make sure that you could see the base of it. It doesn't look like something that needs further evaluation. And we are looking at the skin too of the baby, right? We're looking for rashes, we're looking at the color of the skin, making sure you see if there's any signs of, of jaundice or any of anything else. When this happens, so you're doing the newborn mm -hmm. evaluation of you know, day one, babies, you know, born within the past day. For first time moms, how often have you met the parents before this mm -hmm. evaluation versus 
you're the pediatrician who either, you know, they knew they were going to see you or the doctor had, you know, the OB had you come in. I'm just curious how often you know them before you evaluate the baby. Often we do for a few reasons. One, it might be a second child right. of somebody who comes already to the practice. And so that's common where we, we will know them. Um, and then some where we have done a prenatal visit. So um, I think most peds in New York City do this. I don't know about the rest of the country, but we do prenatal visits now, you know, during the pandemic, we do them um, virtually, but where we meet the parents beforehand. And that, though, doesn't always mean that you'll see that person, right? Because, right. you know, whoever is doing the hospital rounds that day, you know, right. will be there. But, but not all, I mean, not all the time, you know, for a lot of times you do, you haven't met them before. And for, for those prenatal visits, yeah. is that more so for the parents to know her you are just sort of like, you know, get to meet what's the personality like, what has your office work? Or is it something where there's actually like something of substance that's discussed yeah. in terms of the baby or the health or anything like that? Yeah, I always start off asking the parents, you know, what they want to talk about, because some will come with a whole list of questions, right. mostly that they've Googled and says, ask your pediatrician this, you know. Um, so if they do have that list, I kind of want to know at the beginning and we can go through it. But most of the questions are really common. And most of the time we're just going through um, the way that, you know, the office works and, you know, they commonly ask if there's a well waiting room in a sick, although, you know, now post COVID, the question and every, right. the whole conversations are different. We go over the uh, setup of the office with questions, you know, how to reach us if there's questions, our hours when we're open, walk-in hours, sick visits, that kind of stuff. I think it's most important to just get a sense of the doctor and if you feel like it's somebody that you're going to trust, you know, with your baby. You right. know, because I think most of us probably, all the practices in the city probably have the same answers to most of those questions, you know. It's just more of getting a feel for um, if there's somebody that you're comfortable with. Yeah, I think a, a lot of parents find it helpful for that way just to sort of get a yeah. sense that this person or this practice won't be a stranger and the baby's there but is it ever helpful on your end potentially like when you meet with the parents like to you'll take some notes here when this baby you know abc or is it mostly just like all right this is sort of what we do as part of like you know marketing in a sense it's usually not so helpful for us unless there's issues with the baby of course right. but that's not as common there is some sort of issue that anybody's concerned about with the baby that they know the baby will need immediate care then it can be helpful to explain the process of if the baby has to go to the NICU or these are the things that you know might happen afterwards but mostly it's more of just a get to know you right which makes a lot of sense i mean you know parents ask us all the time you know, because they have to find a pediatrician. Who do you recommend? And I always tell them, like, I know so many really good pediatricians. It, it's always hard to find a not good pediatrician, you know, who's at a good hospital or a good, you know, practice. And I say, it's really so much more so, like, what are you looking for? You know, is it do you want someone who's close to where you live because it's easy to yeah. get there? Do you want a big group, a small group? I mean, and so I say, and that we always encourage people say, meet the pediatricians. Like, if you like them, yeah, like, that's great. You know, that's a really good, you know, system in a situation. And it's it's not like, oh, this person's the best doctor in the world. They know so much more than everybody else. It's rarely that unless there's a specific condition or something like that. Yeah, I think being close is really important because you yeah. go to the doctor a lot in the beginning. That is something we usually always cover as parents ask about. And I like to go over is the frequency of the visits in that first year of life. You know, they like to they like to know. And it's important to be close because you are going to be at the doctor a lot, especially in that first month, you know, of yeah. life. You might be coming back in uh, a day or two days or, you know, often in the beginning. So it's important to be close. And it's important to feel like it's somebody that you can ask these, you know, questions to that might be. Um, you might feel silly asking. You don't want to feel silly asking. You right. Know? So it's somebody that you feel comfortable with. Right. When our kid, when my wife was pregnant with our twins, our first kids, we ended up using a pediatrician who I, I knew from medical school. He was one of my teachers is, you know, Dr. John Larson, great guy. And we met with him and we're like, oh, this is great. He's a few blocks away from us. This is perfect. And like two months after our kids were born, their office moved into our building. <laughs> First of all, we're like, this is unbelievable. Like, yeah. We don't have to like, get them dressed. You just take them down in their diapers. Yes. And it's, it was unbelievable. Yeah, it's very convenient yes. to have You'd a pediatrician so, you, close People by. don't realize how important that is in the beginning is to be very convenient to yeah. be located. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so you're examining the baby. And I want to use how often, again, the, the baby's already been born and the nurse or the NICU team, someone's looked at the baby at birth and they're already in the nursery by the time you see them. And obviously the parents have probably spent some time with the baby already. How often is it that you'll pick up something on that exam or assessment that is 
not even concerning, but something that has to be discussed with the parents or followed up? Is it like 50% of the time, like, oh, it happens all the time? Or is it like five to 10? Like what what percentage of time do you find something, even if it's minor? Yeah. I mean, most babies are healthy, right? So most babies are healthy. So the things that we're finding that we talk about commonly, maybe in the beginning, it's usually something that it's just going to be reassuring, like you're reassuring the parents. Like for example, rash, like a very common newborn rash uh, that you see in the first time is something called erythema toxicum, which I always like to say, it's a terrible name because it's not toxic at all. It's right. just a normal newborn rash. But it looks like like pimples on the body and the parents, even if they ha- haven't noticed it yet, they might notice it as soon as you leave the room or the next time they go to change the baby's diaper and get really worried about it. So it's more of that kind of preventative pointing things out that you are reassuring them about, you know. And yes, yeah, certainly other things that we pick up that we need to address more urgently. It's not as, I mean, it's not as common. It might be like hips if the hips feel a little loose. It might be a murmur, but what a murmur, a heart murmur is not uncommon in the first 24 hours. So we usually actually, if you hear it in the first 24 hours, you just kind of wait and see if you still hear it the next day, because a lot of these flow murmurs from the change of fetal cardiac circulation to to the um, other, you know, newborn that just goes away. So, but that is something that we um, might, you know, pick up um, if it's still there on day two or three, then we might have the cardiologist, you know, take a listen and, uh, um, and, and further evaluate. And then the dimple, the sacral dimple, like I said, that's another thing that we um, often will see and might, you know, need an ultrasound or something for. Those are the common things. But most of the time, babies are totally healthy and you're just kind of pointing out, you know, what to what to look for and reassuring. So you do an exam, but there, mm-hmm. there are certain tests that are done in every baby, mm-hmm. uh, or at least in New York City and mm-hmm. newborn babies. What, what tests are done on them aside from uh, an examination yeah. by one of you. Before they leave, the nurses will do a newborn screening test, which is a blood test. They prick the heel and they send that off to the state and it t- tests for, I don't know, 40, 50 different sorts of metabolic and all different, you know, congenital and diseases and stuff. So that takes about two weeks to come back. So the nurses send that off. Every baby gets some sort of assessment of the level of jaundice, right? So jaundice is a baby being yellow because there's too much bilirubin that's bil- being built up in the blood. Bilirubin is normal in all of in all of us because you have red blood cells that are constantly turning over and, and bilirubin is a byproduct of it. But there's a lot of reasons why baby newborn babies in that first you know week of life have higher bilirubin because they have their livers not just mature enough to get rid of everything yet. They also have shorter red blood cell lives and turnover. And they also have, sometimes they're a little dehydrated, which we can talk about too, because babies lose weight. And so there's reasons why their numbers go high. And, and there's literally a uh, nomogram of a per hour of life and every hour and what number would cross the threshold as being too high for that baby at that hour of life. So that's a really big part of the of the beginning. So the babies will either get assessed by a, um, we, there's a screening um, tool, almost like a forehead temperature thermometer, same kind of thing that the nurses will do um, to get an assessment of the bilirubin. If that crosses a threshold, then they might need to get follow that up with a blood test. So so some assessment of bilirubin. Um, hearing screen is something that's done by the nurses before as well, making sure, you know, check for, for congenital hearing loss. Kind of newer, um, more recently in the last few years, is a congenital heart disease screening where the nurses check the um, pulse oxes, so the oxygen levels, you know, of the babies in the upper and the lower extremities to make sure there's not a discrepancy that's concerning for a congenital heart disease. Okay, so th- those are the tests that are routine. And I would mm-hmm. assume most of them are usually normal. Like the Billy Rubin's one that frequently we're chasing mm-hmm. for a while. Right, right. You know, like and the, out, the hearing yeah. screen is not infrequently abnormal yeah. um, because there's so much debris in the ear canals, you know, and like stuff from just amniotic fluid that kind of stays there. So sometimes um, babies will, you know, not pass that in the nursery. And then um, that's something that we actually in our office, um, we w- we can we have the machine and we can test it, you know, again, the in your first or second visit. I like you said, not pass and it failed. <laughs> Yeah, my, my third my fr- my third failed her failed. hearing test, and she had loose hips. Oh, all, all the things. Yeah, she's, she's a disaster. Yeah, so, but she's amazing. She's, yeah, she now has one wonderful <laughs> wonderful attached hips, and she hears beautifully. Yeah, yeah. She even listens no. in addition to hearing. She's a great kid. And then are there routine either medications or vaccinations that are given to newborns in the hospital? The hepatitis B vaccine that's given to babies in the hospital by the nurses. There's the vitamin K shot that's given. There's the eye ointment that's given for prophylaxis as well. I think that's it. I know. Yeah, there's um, no other vaccines that are given in the beginning. Right. Now, does everyone get the hepatitis B vaccine in the hospital? Um, It's offered to everyone, but not required. Right. So if you don't get the hepatitis B in the hospital, then you can get the first dose at your pediatrician's office. Got it. But it's okay. recommended by the academies that everybody gets it in the hospital. Right. And what what kind of things 
would delay a baby from going home at a normal time? Like, what are the common things? Obviously, if the baby's like ill, like there's a, you know, and, and they know about this forever. But what are the types of things where like, oh, we have to keep the baby another day that, you know, parents should maybe be on the lookout for that it might happen, but it's not always a big deal. Yeah. So that would be jaundice, you know, yeah. that might keep you there because if it does, if that level does cross the threshold, the bilirubin, then the baby needs treatment, which is going to be phototherapy, which is lights like a tanning bed. So right. that would be a reason that the baby would stay. And then if there's any concern around about infection, you know, then the baby goes usually then to the NICU and might right. need um, a further workup or maybe two days of antibiotics while you wait, you know, to see. That's it. I mean, most of the time they're not really staying longer for for other reasons. In my experience, the babies usually only stay longer if the mom needs to if stay the, longer. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. They don't discharge the babies without the mother. Right. Yeah, the baby can't get home. Right. <laughs> <laughs> And then now, I mean, babies are going home soon now, too, just like the moms with COVID, you know, right. so and then right. coming. But they do the stay office. 24 hours, 24 hours. Yes. Yeah. And is that, is that is that yeah. is that a, I always wonder, is that a hospital thing or is that a state thing? Is that just sort of the tradition of Mount Sinai? Like why 24 hours? Kind of. It's not just Sinai. It's a, it's a kind of across the board at all. I think it's just because, you know, we need to know at least 24 hours of if the baby's going to do anything funny, you know, where, right. because as a new parents, you don't know what's normal or not normal yet. You know, right. so if there is any concern, you know, that the baby might might need evaluation by the NICU. You'll know in 24 hours. So you you evaluate the baby, all the tests are there, and you're going to see the parents, obviously, and, you know, talk to them, say, hey, I met your baby, he or she's beautiful, you know, and go through everything you did. What are sort of the 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 top five things you tell them? Sort of you tell everybody automatically before they go home from the hospital. Mm -hmm. um, like, and let's go through them one by one. Like, what are the things you want them to know? Sure. Yeah. So, um, the first thing is feeding, right? So, feeding the baby is the focus of the first few weeks, and so I like to talk about that. If they want to breastfeed, then we go over the frequency. You know, of feeding the baby once you leave the hospital, you want to do every two to three hours. I always like to tell them it's from the beginning of one feed to the beginning of the next is how we count it. You want to feed both breasts each time. I usually tell them to do each breast for 15, 20 minutes and then switch to the other one. And I let them know that babies lose weight in the beginning and we expect that and that's okay. You know, so we, um, babies lose, we allow up to like 10% of birth weight and we expect them to lose that. And then we like to see them to start gaining weight by about days three to five of life. Besides feeding, uh, we talk about peas and poops, right? Because that's another way to know um, besides the weight, if the baby is getting enough in is by what's coming out, right? right. So always go over what to expect. So on first day of life, on day one, you want one wet diaper in 24 hours. On day two, you want two wet diapers in 24 hours. Day three, three. Day four, four. Day five, five. And then after that, you are taking you're having five or six wet diapers a day. Um, and the poops, I always like to tell them it's really not about the number, but it's more about the consistency that it starts off as that, you know, that first poop is the thick meconium poop. Um, and then after that, um, it starts to get a little um, more thin and runny and lighter. Um, and what you would call like diarrhea for an adult is ultimately becomes very normal. Looks like couscous. Poop. Yeah, <laughs> couscous. Oh, yeah. We usually call it um, yeah, yellow mustard or, you know, um, seedy mustard. But couscous. Couscous is a good one. Too. That's that's one of the things that stuck with <laughs> I me. Like I was that. like, couscous. Yeah. All right. I, I had a hard time eating couscous for a yeah. while after that. All yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we so we like to um, talk about what to expect with that, peas and poops for the baby. And I always like to talk about, you know, when to call the doctor if you're concerned, um, which will be if there's a fever, you know, you in the first in those first um, two months of life, you do want to call the doctor. So I always tell them, though, don't you don't have to go checking the baby's temperature all the time. You know, you're holding the baby. And if the baby feels like super hot, like really burning up, or if the baby is really acting different, although when you're first taking your baby home, you don't know what different is yet because right. you haven't even you know <laughs> know what your baby's normal is but you know if you really if you can't arouse that baby to feed for you know a feed or two or there's anything that you're really concerned about unclothe the baby let the baby acclimate to room temperature for like 10 minutes and then take a rectal temperature um and that's the only accurate way to do that in the in the newborn period and if it's a hundred point four or above you certainly would want to call the doctor right and when that happens is it usually okay and everything's fine or is it really alarming if there's a fever usually things are just fine but babies don't have um you know they can't tell us if there's a problem they also hard to know if they're sick and so that is really one of the actual signs that you have um, most of the time it winds up being fine but while you're waiting to make sure that it's fine you know um sometimes the baby might need more of a workup you know or not um to, to right to see so and that's one of the reasons that a lot of people are sort of squeamish about having a lot of visitors around their newborns mm -hmm. It's not that they will necessarily get the baby sick, 
but maybe they'll give the baby something that'll cause a slight fever, mm-hmm. which will cause a whole cascade of tests to make sure the baby's not really sick. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. And the baby doesn't have the immune system really yet at all to fight off anything. And the baby doesn't have, you know, um, the first set of shots, although you're, you know, it, it's really more of exactly what you said. It's that uh, you don't want to have to go through that whole workup for right. a little fever. <laughs> After their discharge, when is the first time you normally see them in the office? And an, an unusual situation. Is yeah. it like two days later, two weeks later? When is it? No, normal? no, it's usually a few days. So it can be anywhere from one, two or three days is usually, you know, maybe four days. It's it's within those first few days. And that's to assess what when you see them just to check their weight and everything? everything? Mostly or? it's the weight in the bilirubin um, uh-huh. and feeding, you know, making sure feeding is going um, okay. Make sure the baby is either, you know, not losing too much weight or gaining weight and then checking in if we need to check the bilirubin. Those are the big things we look at in the first visit. Wow, Tracy, that was an amazing review of care of the newborn from the time of birth uh, through discharge from the hospital and the first visit. And I'm really looking forward to doing another podcast with you right away about newborn care from that point through the first few weeks and first few months of life. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to the Healthful Woman Podcast. To learn more about our podcast, please visit our website at www.healthfulwoman.com. That's H-E-A-L-T-H-F-U-L-W-O-M-A-N.com. If you have any questions about this podcast or any other topic you would like us to address, please feel free to email us at hw at healthfulwoman.com. Have a great day. The information discussed in Healthful Woman is intended for educational uses only. It does not replace medical care from your physician. Healthful Woman is meant to expand your knowledge of women's health and does not replace ongoing care from your regular physician or gynecologist. We encourage you to speak with your doctor about specific diagnoses and treatment options for an effective treatment plan.